Thank you for that nice introduction. And thank you for everyone for attending today. Uh, it's been a wild ride uh, to get to this point. So thank you for joining us virtually and those of you who are watching this recording. We have an exciting session today. As much as risk can be exciting, especially in 2020, uh, today's presentation is gonna focus on how do we manage that IT risk? And uh, the IT side of the risk is even more prevalent now than it's ever been as many of you know. And by the time we leave today, you're gonna to have the tools to be able to help document and calculate where you should be focusing your time and energy and how you can help your volunteer leaders, your members, your customers, your colleagues, justify where you, where you should be spending time and how you should be spending that time. So what we're gonna to do today is go over this tool that I've developed uh, with my team on managing and assessing IT risk. And then we're gonna actually complete an IT risk assessment. It's my favorite part. Uh, so one of the, I wanna put it here in the chat for those of you that are live and those of you that are watching in the recording afterwards, it will be up on the slides here in a little bit. It, the document is hosted on my personal box.com account and will be available for seven days from today, which will be oh, like November 6th, I believe is the expiration of the link that I just posted. And those of you on the recording will see in a few slides. And then we're gonna talk about the results. So that is gonna be our agenda for today. All right, so a little bit of background on the assessment tool. While you, those of you that are live, to, to download that and set it up, take a look at it. I created this tool in 2016 and we did it twice. So in 2016, uh, we performed the assessment, we pulled my teams together and I did a presentation to our board of directors. And I talked with my CEO and we really wanted to do it again. Did we make a difference? Did the focus that we put in 2016 and the results of the assessment, are we gonna see a difference? Did we see a difference? Did it work? And we ran it again in 2019. And I'm gonna have comparative results to share with you today. And we needed actionable work on IT risk. It's easy to say, oh, you know, there's a lot of compromises. Before COVID, you know, there was a lot of uh, big companies that were experiencing data breaches. And like, there's a lot of risk out there, but where do you start? And that is where this tool really helps. This is where we need to put our focus. This is where we need to put our energy. Yes, that is a risk but it's a tolerated risk. It's a low risk. So we don't have to worry about it as much because we have bigger fish to fry. So I needed a reputable instrument. So I actually sought many resources and consulted a lot of my colleagues, um, not just in my association, but across the association industry. And I landed on three primary, you know, primary sources in addition to some smaller ones. Those of you that are familiar with Educause, Educause is the owner of the .edu domain extension. They're a sister association of my association, which is the acronym is pronounced Akuho I. So you're gonna see the A-C-U-H-O hyphen I uh, acronym. Uh, Educause is the, is the IT organization for higher education. Uh, so my organization is in campus housing, theirs is in IT and as a specialized. So these are the CIOs of colleges and universities. And they developed an IT risk register. Their CIO groups um, had a big work group a long time ago that came together and put together standards. Uh, I combined that with the, with the NIST um, guide for conducting risk assessment. So some really you know, government focused, high security um, assessment profiles, had a lot of great resources. And also with the GAO, um, the Government Accountability Office, and they had a lot of information security assessment matrices um, that helped guide what this could look like. That framework, and if I'm going a little bit fast, just slow me down. Uh, has 36, actually has 34 risk statements for the, in the Educause IT risk register, and I added two of them. So universities tend to be, you know, large organizations, they're institutions, and they mirror a lot of companies, but they're also very, very similar to associations, not 100%. So I actually added two user-based scenarios to the risk statements to create 36 risk statements. And you'll see a risk statement on the uh, risk assessment, there are rows in the spreadsheet. Uh, and we're gonna go through that here in a little bit. And then there's 11 IT domains and you can see them listed there on the screen. These are the, these, this will help guide where your strong points are, where your weak points are, really give you multiple layers on how to dissect where your IT risk profile is. Because la layered in that is also those functional areas. 
Now, arguably, depending on who you talk to, what industry you're in, there are, are many types or maybe sub layers. Of all, there's all kinds of functional areas that could be defined on the IT side. We're going to simplify that down to six. Any more is, is much more complicated and it's hard to act on a lot of variables, right? So having six functional areas defined in this framework uh, makes the outcome of this assessment much more actionable. And you can see that these six uh, functional areas here, um, so you can uh, take a look at those and we're gonna really work with these. All right, so I mentioned scoring um, and one of the areas that really makes this assessment work is putting data against the risk statements. So when it comes down to, you know, how do you assign value to the subjective? And that's what this does. So you could, on the matrix, on the matrix, you have the impact severity and the probability of occurrence. And these are going to be our attributes for choosing and evaluating each of our 36 risk statements. And they're going to assign a score. And you can see the green areas are acceptable, reviewable, and undesirable. Those are the types of risk. And you're gonna, we're gonna see the results of that here in a little bit, but this is where the results are. So if you have an improbable low risk area, that's that 0, 0.0 column that, you know, you know, square there, that is gonna be an area that you're not gonna really worry about right now. It's gonna be incredibly low risk. If you have something that is a high severity and the probability of occurrence is frequent, a 1.0, that is something that is incredibly high risk and you need to focus on that area in immediately in the short, you know, the short term, have a plan for how to lower that risk. So this matrix really helps and this is where the calculations come in uh, on the spreadsheet. Um, that many of you uh, hopefully have already downloaded. And then there's, these are defined. Um, so each, each undesirable, reviewable, and acceptable level of risk is assigned as you can read on the screen here. So as I was saying earlier, undesirable are those areas that are very, very risky. They're actually putting associ your association or your organization in a place that you don't wanna be. You know, reviewable are those cautionable spaces and you would think that this is probably like a bell curve and you're right typically um, when i've worked with other associations uh, with this assessment and in our own association typically it starts out around a bell curve but what i have also found and that you know, we'll discuss near the end of the presentation here is it actually the bell shifts upward as you as you begin to focus on your risk profile and it worked on the reviewable and undesirable risk that bell curve actually moves to the acceptable range. So the, the curve moves from the middle to the acceptable. And then it, you know, it's really interesting to watch. As you focus on anything in life, that area becomes stronger. And the same thing with IT risk. When you start focusing on the areas that are actionable, then there are more items that are less actionable and you can, and there's always gonna be some risk, but you're not, you might go from 15 to one. And that is a, a very ideal place to be. I'm going to pause here because I'm going to take a breath <laughs> and just to see how if everyone's feeling okay uh, with the content, if there's any questions so far. So this is where our risk assessment time comes in. So I'm going to hold this graphic on the screen here for a, a little bit. Um, as we, those of you that are watching the recording might pause um, and take time to download this. This is an Excel spreadsheet and I'm going to open it up here on the screen share uh, just in a second. Um, this again, this is hosted on my personal box.com account. It is a secure host and the link will be available until November 6th, uh, 2020. Uh, it has a limited download time frame that I put on there. However, if some of you would like to leverage this particular tool after the fact, um, my contact information, I'm easily Googleable by my name, um, but you can also um, get my information Oh, from the presentation site as well. All right. Are we ready to move on? Yes, shakings of heads. <laughs> and those of you watching the, the recording afterwards, hopefully you have your Excel spreadsheet open, maybe on another screen here, and are going to work through the assessment with us. All right. Now, I've already zoomed in 
um, to the area that we need to be in. And I've already made it hopefully big enough uh, for everyone to see here on the particular screen share. Uh, so those of you that are following along on your own screens or on your other monitors, when I'm looking this way, I'm looking on my other monitor here. Uh, what, we're gonna, what I want you to do is follow along with us. We're gonna work through each of the 36 risk statements. And there's a lot of detail. If I were to scroll over on where each of these risk statements falls in the functional areas, in the, in the IT domains, there additional detail on what it means. So there's a lot more here than you're seeing in this zoomed in view. Uh, so really welcoming your, your review of that content and with yourself and with your team will be a valuable thing to do on your own. But right now, our goal is to work through each of these uh, 36 statements. It doesn't take as long as you think it does. Um, so I don't want you to think too hard. And Russ uh, was a great, grateful volunteer. Uh, he's going to think about either his organization or maybe one that he's worked at in the past and go through this risk assessment. Um, but I would also encourage you to, while you're doing this now live with me or maybe in a recording, uh, afterwards, I want you to just hold, save this data, but I want you to do it again with your team. And I'm going to talk about the approach that I did with my association on how we utilize this tool where I did it, my team did it, and we took it up to a leadership level, and then we worked those results. So one person can't fill this out, but that's what we're going to do today to really demonstrate the instrument. All right. Are we ready to go, Russ? Yes, All right. just point me in the right direction. All right, you got it, sir. All right, our first risk statement here is IT assets. Uh, systems and services outdated, they do not support institutional needs. And there are two columns here, and each one, they're all gonna be the same dropdowns. The first one is probability. You have frequent, occasional, remote, and improbable. So what, in this case, from an IT systems or IT assets, and the systems and services are outdated, what is the probability of that happening? What is, what is the probability that IT assets and systems do not support institutional needs? It's remote. And the impact is on all of these is high, medium, and low. So if there were, if that remote chance were to happen, would the impact of this risk be high, medium, or low? Low. Perfect, thank you. Probably medium, now that I think of it. All right, perfect. That is what we're going to do a 35 more times. And that's, <laughs> <laughs> but as you think about these risk statements, uh, there's a lot, you don't, don't want you to overthink these, uh, especially this first pass. No process for ensuring institutional data remains complete, accurate, and valid during input, update, and storage. Again, frequent, occasional, remote, or improbable. This is remote. Smooth. Then high, medium, or low impact. Medium. Failure to control logical access and incorporate principles of least functionality to IT resources. So that would be improbable. That's a really good one. High, medium, or low impact if that improbable scenario were to happen. Low. We have redundancy. Oh, bless you. <laughs> All right, a lack of shared understanding by IT and business units that affects IT service delivery and projects. The probability of that happening. That's remote. And the impact if it were to happen. Very low. Great. Uh, IT projects are not managed in terms of budget, scheduling, scope, priority, and delivery. Occasional. And the impact of that risk when it happens. That would be medium. We have a tight budget, but we have room for overflow. <laughs> nice. All right. Incorrect information on public facing institutional resources like websites and social media. Occasional. And the impact of that happening. That's medium. Okay. We review that weekly almost. Oh, nice. Critical organizational business data not available when needed. That's improbable. And the impact if it were to happen? That'd probably be high. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did I, 
All right, there we go. Loss of access to IT systems and services hosted by another organization for an unacceptable period of time. Occasional. And the impact when that happens. That'd be medium. Okay. We try not to put all of our eggs in one basket these days. That's super smart. That definitely lowers the risk profile. I'm sure we all have more stories about scenarios when one system goes down. If you put everything connect, you know, connected together, or all linked to one resource, it takes them all down. Yeah, that's why we try to host our different, like accounting service by one third party vendor, finance by another third party vendor. So we have different points of failure, but nothing that would bring the whole ship down. That's great. You're gonna, that's amazing. Uh, the next risk statement, users inadvertently modify, destroy, or disclose restricted or sensitive material. Occasional. And the impact when that happens. Medium. There's no succession plan for institutional IT leaders. That's probably frequent and the impact when that happens. That would be high. All right, relevant stakeholders not included in important IT investment decision-making processes. That's improbable. And if it were to happen, it would be? It'd probably be pretty high. <laughs> All right. And I hope everyone else is following along uh, on their own spreadsheets here as we go through each one of these. Uh, IT assets and systems are not prioritized based on their classification, criticality, and institutional value. That's remote. And the impact, if it were to happen? Low. All right. There's no process for measuring and managing IT performance. Remote. And if it were to happen? Medium. Right. You're doing great, Russ. The next one, no process for managing IT problems to ensure they are adequately resolved or for investigating causes to prevent recurrence. That's improbable. And if it were to happen? It would be high if it were to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, IT communications and networks not protected from complete or intermittent failure. Improbable. If it were to happen, it would be? Medium. All right. We're backed up now to redundant sites. So. Nice. Failure to make adequate plans in the event of an IT outage for an extended period of time. Improbable. And if it were to happen? It would be pretty, no, it'd be medium. It'd be medium. All right. A data breach or leak of sensitive information. The odds of that happening are? Remote. And if it did happen, the impact would be? Medium. We don't deal in PHI or anything, so. Nice. All right. Inadequate cybersecurity incident or event response. Occasional. And when it does happen, it is typically? Medium. Okay. We haven't had one of those yet, so. I'm not gonna... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Institutional IT communication and data flows not documented. Yeah, that's occasional. And the impact? That would be medium. All right, we're doing great. Almost there. Licenses and permits for institutional IT systems and software not maintained. Occasional. And when it does happen, the impact is? Low. All right. Users do not follow legal or regulatory requirements regarding the operation and use of IT systems and the use of data. <laughs> I would say that's remote. All right, and the impact, if it were to happen? Medium. All right. 
because like I said earlier, we do a lot of third party stuff. So they're responsible. We have an agreement with them, but they're responsible for a lot of the regulatory um, constrictions and restraints and liability. Nice. You, you, you put a lot of, uh, you have a lot of safeguards in place. I love hearing um, your story. And we're just tip of the iceberg on this, Russ. This is great. All right, users do not follow organizational policies regarding the operational use of IT systems and data. That's improbable. You have a great staff. Uh, the, the impact of, if it were to happen? Medium. All right. Uh, users inadvertently modify, destroy, or utilize information technology facilities and equipment. Improbable. No one spills coffee on a laptop ever? Oh, well, very, very rarely. <laughs> it's more like um, the warranty is expired. And once the warranty expires on a laptop or something like that, because mm. all of our laptops have next day service. Oh, nice. Uh, and once they go out of warranty, I do best practices to keep it running. But we usually um, reclassify that as a loaner laptop or something to that nature. We keep it running as long as it's functional, high functioning. And then we just retire it or use it as a loaner. And then we destroy it. We wipe the drive and destroy it or donate it. Perfect. All right. And the impact? It would be pretty medium because like I said earlier, we have a lot of things in redundant facilities and things like that. So yep. if one of our servers goes down, another one just comes right back up, high availability, and then we have offsite. Nice. Well, I, I want to take this moment in our go review of the spreadsheet. Those are that are follow following along on their own, maybe a little bit of chance to catch up. This is a great opportunity to really highlight some of the discussion that we're having. A lot of when you do this as a team, and you'll see the results of this in my um, wrap up points, oh, this is a discussion tool, just as much as it is an assessment tool. There's a lot of lenses and viewpoints that can contribute to the discussion. And that is just as valuable as the data that you're going to get as a result of the assessment itself. Um, I found that to be very true. Um, cause, and there's some of these conversations where, like maybe, you know, Russ, there might be somebody in your organization that didn't know what you just said, what you just shared about how you're managing IT assets. So it's an opportunity to say, hey, you know, we actually do have a process in, in place or a way to handle a situation. Did you know that? Oh, no, I had no idea. I thought we were really risky in that area. Well, it turns out we're not. And so it's, it was, it's a really good opening tool in, for communication, uh, just as much as it is risk identification. All right, moving on. Uh, IT governance and priorities are not aligned with institutional priorities. That's remote. I take my directives from the top. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if it were to happen, though, the impact would be? Medium. All right. A failure to designate leadership for institutional oversight and strategic direction for operations. That's occasional. And when it does happen, it is? Medium. A failure to designate, whoa, there we failure to designate leadership for, is that the same one? No, this is for information security activities. Yes. And the. This is occasional. And that's medium. medium too, because we use a third party audit. Awesome. All right, we're almost there. No process for identifying and allocating costs attributable to IT services. No, that's remote. I always prefer provide a budget with anticipated and fixed cost. So um, medium, there are, always, there are always those unexpected costs, but we kind of put a separate budget for that. Mm. Makes sense. All right, next one here. Failure to create and maintain sufficient and current policies and standards to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data and IT resources. That's occasional. And the impact? Medium. All right. Failure to control physical access to data centers, facilities, or areas housing critical IT resources. That's remote. Nobody has a key to your to your just, server room at your place. Just me and the um, CIO. Perfect. Limited access. That's great. It's low. 
a failure to follow organized lifecycle management practices for institutional IT resources and systems. That's improbable. I already said that we just get a three day, three year warranty next business day. We try to extend it after that as long as it's working. And I'm not gonna throw good money after bad trying to upkeep something. Yep. So this is low. Smart. All right. Getting down to the end here. Audit logs on critical IT systems and processes not maintained. This is probably occasional. I manually review, we don't maintain those logs. Um, and I would say this is probably high. Okay. Uh, IT management aims and directions not communicated with critical user areas. That's remote. And the impact? That's medium. Okay. Uh, housing critical IT assets or services physically inaccessible, inoperable, or unsuitable for human access. That's remote. I mean, yeah, probably remote. And the impact if it were to happen? Low, because those things, they would have to get into the network server room to get access to our virtual servers. And even then it's not a console. So they'd have to breach the server room, then have the password for the vertex box to get on, and then the passwords for each of the servers and VMware to manipulate data. So yeah, I think that's a good answer. Great. No coordinated vetting or review process for third party or cloud computing services used to store, process, or transmit institutional data. That's remote right now. In the impact, if it were to happen? Probably pretty high. Okay, we're near the bottom of the area now. The last two, failure to document institutional IT infrastructure, architecture, and to implement change control processes. That's improbable. And the impact if it were to happen? It'd probably be medium. All right, and last one here. IT staff insufficient to ensure continuous IT system operations. That would be occasional. In the impact when it happens? That would probably be medium. All right. So we worked through all of our risk statements. And if I were to sh shrink this back up a little bit, I do have a button up here, if you noticed, uh, on your own. I hid the level of risk areas. So one of the things is I'll say, oh, I don't want that to be green. I don't want it to be that color. We remove that capability as you go through the risk assessment. So there's a, this button here is helpful because as you work through with you, your teams, and we'll talk about the approach that, that I've used and recommend, is to hide that. Because a lot of times when you go through, you have an immediate reaction to lower the risk. And you don't want that reaction. You want an honest, valuable assessment. Now there, is, there are calculations um, that take place on the right, but in the, next, in the tab below, there's risk findings. So Russ, this is where you typically fell uh, in your responses. And I'm gonna just magnify some of these areas here and you can evaluate these on your, on your own, um, but I can also uh, save this and send it to you afterwards as well so you can see where you performed live. Um, but you can see that you had two areas that fall in undesirable, 11 that are reviewable risk, and 23 that fall in the acceptable risk range for you, Russ. And your distribution falls like this. This is actually a really good curve to start out with. Uh, so you have very manageable level. So you have, you know, 13 areas that you just might want to take a little bit of a closer look and you might actually make some adjustments along the way. Now, where do those things typically fall? They come into play in those areas we talked about earlier. So we have these focus areas or these functional areas and you can see where you're, these risks are falling in each of them. And then you can see in these IT domains where they typically falling. And there are graphs, and I'm gonna leave it in large, you know, zoomed in or enlarged, where your risks are falling. So you can see your undesirables are your system operational and strategic areas. So there's those two. And while there's three bars here, a, a risk statement can cross many categories. And so that's why you're not gonna have the numbers exactly add up because there's overlap 
um, and how these risk statements, you know, work with the function that are functional areas in the categories. You can see in a different way, your undesirable risk, it's just a different way to view the same type of data. So you can view it that way. And then you can also see where in your IT domains, where your areas are falling in this way as well. So there's a, there's a report function. I'm gonna move back over to the PowerPoint now to really kind of summarize that. Now this is obviously a kind of a, a rough, you know, data dashboard, right? There's a report format that you would translate, translate this into and wrap, and wrap a narrative around. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit. And I just wanna check in with Andrew to see how we're doing on time. We're doing well, we have about, about eight minutes left. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so thank you, Russ, so much for your participation, your honesty, and just going through that. Um, it was really, really helpful, and I really appreciated the narrative that you demonstrated because that is really where we're gonna be headed now, and that's uh, what is an important layer to a calculated assessment. Now, the data that we're gonna look at now is my actual organizational data. So in 2016 is on your on the left here, and in 2019 is on the right. So we fell very similarly um, in our curve, but we had a lot more reviewable than acceptable. When we ran the assessment again in 2019, the pie shifted, and it was it was that bell curve shift that we experienced before. So we reduced the number of undesirables. We reduced the number of reviewable risk statements and we increased our level of acceptable risk areas. Another way to look at that um, is across our functional areas. And this is a comparative analysis again. Those of you that are watching the recording could pause on this if you wanna take a little bit of a closer look at it. Um, but this is kind of one of those deeper dive information for you know, your CIOs, your directors of ITs, anybody that's really interested, because it is kind of fascinating when you get into understanding the level, the risk statements, descriptions, and things like that. Uh, very similarly, um, where in my organization, where our service area analysis, uh, where our risks fell, um, and this is a, a current uh, in 2019, so we still have some undesirable risk in information security, uh, management of IT, and IT support services. Uh, I think this is probably one of my favorite uh, depictions of the data. Um, it suggests the performance. And this is something that I like to really share with our board of directors on our progress. So in 2016, it was this orange curve or this top one. You can see it's kind of bell curve, right? In 2019, it's inverted. So that's a good thing. So we, we flipped where our risk profile was in three years. So we had less undesirable by a couple, we had less reviewable, which is great, and we had more acceptable levels of risk. Now the, the rationale and the contribution pieces. So this is, this is where you apply that human interpretation. So this is kind of what Russ was doing along the way. So the way that uh, I approached it with my team is I had me and my direct reports do exactly what Russ and I did. We sat down and we went line by line. We had a conversation. We're like, oh, you know, we have this, this, and this, and this. That's really not as bad as I thought. It's low. Or, wow, I didn't really think about that, Russ. You, when you said that, that really, it really makes me think that's a really high risk now. You have a conversation on each risk statement and you come to a conclusion so that was level one then i took it to actually i did i did three levels then i took me um and my peer our cfo um, she and i just went through it and we went through and, and did it all together then i reviewed it with our cio and in those in the level two and level three reviews we actually look at the results of me and my team's review so we don't take the assessment again we review the outcomes we review that hidden layer. So back over to this risk statement, we actually showed this risk level column. So when the leadership team reviews, we're looking at, okay, well, let's just, let's just zip down to this red one here. So this red one is no succession plan. You know, that's a 1.0. Okay. Well, that is an area of focus. So we focus a lot on in the leader, in the level two, level three reviews on the yellows and the red ones or the reviewables in the undesirables. And we ask ourselves, is that still the right score or is that the right level is there a level of conversation that needs to happen here what contributed 
to that conversation. And it was an opportunity for me to say, hey, here's, what, here's how the team interpreted that. And this is why we came to that conclusion. And so it was an opportunity to open up a conversation to focus on those undesirables on why. And there is some strategy to it as well. So there are some undesirables that you may say, you know, while that might be a lower risk, where we are right now, it really isn't. And so you, you apply a layer, layer of human. <laughs> you know, to, to the thought process, uh, because while it technically might be reviewable, actually, you know what, because we're human and that could happen, it's really undesirable. We need to be stronger in that area just a little bit more. And looking at those next steps, that is where, that is where you need to prepare, you know, put this in a narrative report, kind of type, type those conversation out a little bit. What I did was I took the undesirables and I put the description and I put the team's discussion points. I didn't do that for all 36 because that's a little, that's laborious. I focus on those undesirables. The reviewable ones are kind of those cautionary ones. They're, they don't require immediate action, but they require some, maybe a closer look and a re-review. It doesn't mean you don't do anything about those reviewables. And also doesn't really mean you don't do anything about the acceptable ones. However, if you're going to prioritize your time, if you're going to prioritize your board of directors focus, you want to have them focus on the undesirables. And so that is where you define your next steps. Okay, so what are we going to do about those undesirables? What are we going to do about the, that succession plan for the CIO? What are we going to do about that? And wh what is our time frame for, for handling or addressing that particular risk? And what is our act? Some of these are really complicated and they might require action plans. They might require contract adjustments, you know, what have you. So that discussion and that narrative really adds value to the objective assessment. And that really brings me to the close of our presentation. Um, thank you again to Russ for your participation during the session. I think it really helped um, guide us through in a very you know, slow but good way so everyone could follow along. So thank you again. Um, and I know that we don't have a lot of time for discussion, um, but my contact information can be easily found at Sean Holloway. That is also my handle on pretty much every social media platform, um, including LinkedIn. Um, so please connect with me, uh, reach out with any questions, um, and you have the link to download the assessment uh, spreadsheet, the one that I just worked through with Russ for another seven days until November 6th. So thank you again.